coming along this afternoon to PPCA's uh, panel session. My name is Lynn Small and I'm the General Manager at PPCA. Uh, we're here this afternoon to find out about DIY record labels. So I'm not going to spend the time talking about PPCA. But I certainly urge you all to get down to the music market. We've got members of our team down there ready to help people register to tell you about what we do and uh, to take us through some issues that we think are really important to people who uh, have a career in the music industry today. So please spend 10 minutes and go down and see our team. They're waiting for you to arrive. Um, our panellists today are uh, starting on the right hand end uh, Brett Oten, Bill Cullen, Jackie Crouch, and Nicole Hart. So I'd like to just start by asking um, our panellists to tell us a bit about themselves and where they come from. Can we start down here already, please, Brett? Uh, sure. Um, I, uh, I'm a lawyer and I have my own law firm. Um, uh, called Brett Oaten Solicitors. I'm very imaginative. And um, uh, we predominantly represent artists in the music industry and help them negotiate their record deals and management deals and set up their businesses and, uh, and things like that. I um, am an artist manager. I uh, run a company called One Ladder Entertainment and we currently manage uh, Paul Kelly, Sarah Blasco and Kate Miller-Heitke. Um, I've been working in the digital space for about oh, 12 years now, I think, starting at Universal, um, moving to iTunes, and now I run my own digital consulting company called DigiRascal. And um, I've, gosh, been doing PR, radio, that kind of thing for over 20 years now, and I have my own company, Revolutions Per Minute, so we look after publicity campaigns and radio campaigns um, for various artists, and um, yeah, have a lot of fun. Now, before we move on, just so we know who we're talking to, can we find a little bit out about our audience? Can I ask you to, to put your hand up if you're currently a songwriter and you're writing songs? And I'd assume you could all keep your hand up because you're members of ACRA. Is that right? Yeah, great ratio. Um, how many of you are creating your own recordings or perhaps own recordings? Now, can I ask you to keep your hand up if you've registered with PBCA? Most people who haven't, of course, will be running down to our booth if this is over. And how many people here already have a manager? Okay, thanks for that. We're going to start out now with, um, because it is PBCA and we're all copyright nerds, we're going to start with beyond copyright because we think that's pretty important. So, Brett, can you take people through you know, the basics of what copyright is and, and what artists in particular need to be aware of? Um, well, I guess it's probably best to talk about it in the context of the panel today, which is the, you know, putting out your own records and DIY, but, but copyright just refers to the collection of laws which govern your rights as a creator of artistic works, uh, whether they are songs that you write or, or, or um, literary works like books that you write or, or art that you paint or photographs that you take, but for the purposes of the exercise there is copyright in songs that you write and there are also uh, copyright in um, recordings that you make. And the copyright laws give you the ability to control your work and to decide what happens with it. And, and of course they also give you the ability to give your work to other people for a price if that's what you want to do. And that's really what a record deal is, that you're giving away or either forever or for a period of time, the rights that you own in return for investment in your career. Um, if you are going to make your own recordings and release them yourself, then as the person that's funding the recording, the fundamental thing that you need to make sure is that you own those recordings and you need to secure the copyright from the people that contribute to the recordings. The Copyright Act says that the copyright owner uh, uh, all the people that contribute to the recording. So if you're making an album and you get someone in to play the cello, uh, you need to secure those rights for them, otherwise as a contributor to the recording they will be a part owner of the copyright. Um, there's a separate copyright in the songs and so as a re and, 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 and royalties that you have to pay to the songwriter, who, who may or may not be you. Um, so if you're releasing recordings yourself, just as a major label does, you need to make sure that you put arrangements in place to pay the royalties to the songwriter, again, which may be you, in which case it's not that big of a deal, uh, 
for each copy of the recording that you sell, whether it's a CD or a download or whatever. Does that yeah, no, answer the question, Lynn? So, Brett, what's the difference then? If, if I'm an artist and I'm trying to do it myself, it, am I giving up the fact that if I have a record company, they'll do all that for me? Um, do I still need a lawyer if I have a record label, or is that an extra cost I have when I'm doing it on my own? Well, if you put out your own recordings, then you you become the record company, essentially, and you need to replicate all of the functions of the record company. You need to find a distributor, you need to um, uh, make the artwork, you need to promote the record, you need to market the record, and, and, and if you can do all of that well, then there may well be much greater financial rewards for you than there would be if you had a record company. But that, that's not an easy task, it's very hard to do that, and some artists are very good at doing all of that themselves and some are, you know, spectacularly bad at it and, um, but also, y you know, you, you need the, the money or the resources in some way to, to make the records yourself because one of the things that a record company does for you and, and possibly the primary thing that it does for you, particularly as time goes on and they do less other things for you, is, is to fund your recordings and, and you may be able to do that yourself or you may not and maybe you've got money to do it or maybe you can make an album on GarageBand at home. Um, uh, but the other thing you've got to think about is, is what I'm going to put out my record myself means because I think for a lot of artists I'm going to put out my own record means I'm not going to sign a record deal and I'm going to expect my manager to be a label as well as a manager but I don't really want to pay them anymore and um, that's not really a feasible long-term solution and I think that artists who have successfully released their own recordings have to address all of those questions about how they're going to do that. Yeah and, and that's really a nice segue into asking Bill a bit about what an artist manager does for an act. Um, what sort of services do they provide and is that something in the DIY label situation an artist can realistically take on for themselves? Look we, I guess the best def definition of a manager to me is that we basically the bridge between the art and the commerce. I think any artist is trying to interface with the business world at some point. Um, so we kind of take the art and try to take it to market, I guess. Um, but that, that means dealing with you know everything from touring to releasing records, whether through a record company or uh, without a record company, dealing with publishers, dealing with lawyers, accountants, um, pretty much every interface with the business out there. And do you think that's changed now? People are, the record labels are doing less. Has there been a change in the artist manager role, do you think, over the last 18 years? Look, I, yeah, I'd say over the last eight years or so, it's changed drastically, where there's probably half as many people working at all the major labels. Um, the services they provide are just, you know, less and less as the internet has become a, a, a bigger part of what you need to do in a marketing sense, the more you know, that seems to have all fallen on the artists. Um, so yeah, a manager's job has changed a lot because we're expected to fill those gaps that, that once were provided by a label and aren't anymore. And if I'm an artist and I'm, if, if I'm lucky enough to have a choice, the options of do I go with a record label deal or do I want to do it myself? Um, can I consider if I'm going with a record label that they'll handle the artist management side of things? But do a I still need a manager? Absolutely not, um, because the interests of a label can be very different to the interests of the artist. Labels are generally trying to sell as many records in a short time as possible. Um, as an artist, you've only got one career and you want that career to last as long as possible, whereas labels are generally, you know, it, it, given that they're all public companies now are always, you know, they need to turn the numbers every quarter and that's, that's their business model and you can't really argue with it, but you do need somebody to represent your interests, which are often very different to the label's mm -hmm. interests. And how do you decide, um, how do you decide which artists you're going to work with? Do you have people coming, pitching to you all the time? It could be, could be yes to both of these. Are people always coming to you saying, please represent me? Or are you out looking and sort of inviting particular artists to be um, 
start a relationship? Look, we get approached, yeah, all the time, you know, kind of dozens of approaches a week. Um, but the reality is we look after three artists. We've represented them all for, you know, the shortest one is three years. So it's very rare that we take on new artists. We're not, um, we're not looking, because look, it, it takes a long time to develop an artist. It's very hard to, you know, by taking a commission, the artist is actually, you know, really, to be realistically and brutal, it's got to generate a fair bit of money to make it worthwhile for us to keep doing it, because we need to make a, a living as well. Yeah. Um, we can't just take on artists that, unless we really believe that they are going to generate enough income for us to make a living. And I speak for your business, it's also important to think about um, what stage of their career path each artist is at that you're managing. Absolutely. Uh, because presumably you can't have everyone um, no, you can't doing have international them. tours this year, and, you know, you'd be hoping that it's sort of spread yeah, out. You'd hope not, but they, you know, of course we've got three... They do it to you, yeah. You know, one, yeah, look, we had a pretty quiet year last year, but now... You know, Kate Milhike just released a record a month ago. Paul Kelly and Sarah will both have records out in October. They just everybody, don't cooperate everybody, everybody will be touring nationally and internationally this year. So yeah, you, you'd like to try to plan it, but it never works out that way. So talking about distribution for a minute, and, and Bill, you might like to weigh in there as well, but really, but Jackie, I'm, I'm wondering if I don't have a record label, I'm doing it myself. What's the best channel I've got to try and get my music out to the market? What, what should I be thinking? Does it have to be a physical channel anymore? Can I just rely on sort of internet delivery? Can I make my mark without having physical distribution? I think the operative word in that sentence was what's the best option? And that will literally change from artist to artist. Um, there are thousands of ways now that you can get your content out into the stratosphere, um, particularly digitally. Uh, there's aggregators, there's distributors, there's labels, they all have facilities for you to get your music out there. Distribution is actually easier now than it has ever been. Um, being able to, in that, you know, you can get your stuff onto iTunes or you can get your stuff onto Spotify now. Um, distribution is not hard. Um, that's actually probably one of the easier parts of um, an artist's job right now if they are doing DIY. Um, do I think physical is important? I would probably ask Bill to back me up on this. I think that physical is important, particularly in this market and particularly for touring. Yeah, I think, I think from a media point of view too, it's still... It's very hard to get anyone in the media to take you know, to email them a zip file or something, they still want to see a CD yeah. come across their desk. Um, yeah, and you know, what are we, about 70% of the market still yeah. physical? You can't ignore Unless that. The singles market. Singles market, yeah, yeah, yeah don't bother yeah. pressing the yeah. single. Yeah. But you know, but you, if you're putting out single, you'll still need to do burns to get to radio. They, they still don't take it seriously, unless there's a CD. And also, I think, selling physical copies on the road is becoming yeah. Yeah. a more and more important part of, a, of an artist's thing, uh, of an artist's business, you know, for a number of reasons, as Bill, I'm sure, will back up, is one, that you get the retail margin yeah. when you sell it yourself, not just, um, not just a royalty. And also, many, many artists, you know, much bigger artists than would ever have done this five years ago will do uh, meet and greets with fans yeah. to sell CDs and sign, and sign CDs yeah. after a show and build up that fan interaction in a way that perhaps they didn't need to do or were too complacent to do um, a few years ago. Kate Milhike has funded all her US touring by selling CDs at gigs and she, she'll sell 100 to 150 a night but she'll stand there for two hours if it takes that long and sign every one of them. But, you know, at, and a at $10 will, a CD, that, um, that pays for a touring. But, you know, Kate won't remember probably any of those 150 people, but every single one of them will remember yeah. that yeah. she took the trouble to do that. Yeah. And, uh, Jackie, it, it sounds pretty easy then to get my music on a digital service. Very easy, yeah. So I don't have to worry about, do I have a major label behind me or any sort of label? Um, it, it, in a DIY method, um, and again, I'm going to say it, it really comes down to each band. Um, I think there's a tipping point. There comes a tipping point for a lot of bands where, if they, even if they are DIY addicts and you know they're, they're brilliant at doing everything, there's a tipping point where it's just not feasible for you to be doing everything. It's actually a waste of your time to be doing everything. And, and, and that's probably true across all the 
elements of the Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Well, yeah. And also, distribution is easier than ever. Interacting with mm. fans is easier than ever. Making a record is cheaper and easier than ever. But, but it doesn't mean anybody knows you exist. Yeah. You yeah. know? I, I can go home this afternoon and make a record and put it out, uh, but it won't necessarily be any good, and it doesn't mean that anyone will care. Mm. So the fact that there is a, a, a kind of technological capability of doing things is kind of... I think there's a lot of crap out there. It, uh, it's yeah. not necessarily <laughs> the be-all and end-all. Yeah. You've still yeah. got to be really great and, and work really hard. And I, I'd argue that you've actually got to be great enough to rise through it. You've got right. to try and get your share of voice mm. from a, a much bigger pool now. Yeah. And, and where the, the majors used to control a lot of the gateways and they could actually spend enough money and push something that was mediocre to break through, you can't do that anymore. Everything has to be, yeah. has to be you know, brilliant to break through. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what has to happen first then? I mean, we, we've talked about it's, it's pretty easy for me to get my product but should I be focusing on that first or working on, you know, trying to get a buzz around it or get people interested in the fact my product's coming? I think it needs to work concurrently. There's absolutely no point going out there building a buzz if someone hears about you and then can't go and buy it. Um, but likewise, you know, there's, there's no point having something online if you're not going to actually work it, you know, unless all you want to do is sell a copy to your mum and your mates, you know. Um, it, it needs to work concurrently and it needs to be built organically and, yeah. and just work it. And I, and I don't think the plan should be to what can I do to build a buzz? You know, the, build a buzz by being really, really good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Do, do what. You, so do because you, if you if you if you can attract a lot of attention, but there's no substance there, people people see that. It's really yeah. Trendy. It's a very short term kind of strategy, I think. Rebecca Black, you know, how long did that last? <laughs> oh. I'm, about yeah. I'm still waiting for her follow-ups <laughs> on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. But I just Saturday. keep waiting yeah. for the, I just keep waiting for the album. Yeah, you know, yeah. I haven't dropped it. No. So, Jackie, is that part of what services like your company offers? offers? Is that what... I call myself a, a truthometer um, for bands. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, look I think... <laughs> Look, it, uh, I mean, it probably comes down to well, a lot of people on this panel being... It, 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 you do have to be even more realistic with bands these days. You know, if they're not ready you know, to pitch for an iTunes single of the week, you have to be the one that can tell them that they're not ready for that, that they need to do you know, X, Y, Z before they get there. And you know, it's Because there are so many DIY options out there, um, people can kind of get lost in terms of where to go for marketing, in terms of um, how, you, how to promote your album, well, how do you get to that next step? And, well, that's what I hope to and, do. And that's interesting. You talked about, you know, pitching to iTunes for single of the week. I mean, we, we talked earlier about, are they interested in you if you don't have a record label? Yes, they are. But is, is that, um, how does somebody walk up and say, well, iTunes, <laughs> I'd like to be single of the week? Um, look... At the end of the day, um, Hi, I someone that used to work yeah. at iTunes. <laughs> that, 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 that would be a good start. Yeah. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, um, iTunes is an editorial service, so it is all about the music. If the music is good, then they will want to talk to you, um, and it's as easy as that. There are um, there's email addresses that you know are freely available in terms of you know being able to contact label reps locally. Um, that will listen to your stuff. Well, we're talking a lot now about how we get people to know us and get stuff out there, so we might try to do a for a while and ask you, what, what's a publicist's role? What, what are they doing? How do they interact with journalists yeah. and the media? What do they do for me as an artist that I can't do myself? Absolutely. I think a publicist's job is to promote and sell you um, as an artist, whether it's profile building or, um, you know, security securing editorial coverage for your album or your tour. So, I mean, I, for me, it's a salesperson, uh, but they have great relationships with media and it's their role to nurture those relationships, make sure you get that great review in Metro or Drum Media or whatever. So, um, you know, you're very much, um, you know, representing the artists and getting their music out there. So it's a, it's a really important part of the process. And do you work with, the artists that you work with, do you work with them about how they would time yeah, absolutely. Yep. I mean, a lot of people come to us actually wanting advice on when should I do this, you know, do I release two singles, three singles and an album, 
Um, so you get involved in that whole process. Um, and, um, you know, there's things that we can do, like we would say, um, if you're going to put a single out, um, you know, how, how soon should the album follow? Have you got a tour in place? So we just interact on all those kind of levels. Okay. So do I just need publicists when I've got something happening, if I'm releasing a product or if I'm going on tour next week? What sort of, do you work with people over the, over the long haul or are you working sort of short-term projects? Look, you, you could. I, mean, I think generally people use publicists when they've got an album or a tour ready to go. But then there are some artists who I think just want to do profile building and get the name out there. Um, so you, you'll just do little things that, you know, perhaps get them a pick in a blurb here or whatever. So just building the name but not necessarily selling anything right there and then. So you, you could, but I think that would be a rarer exception in this marketplace. Yeah. So what's the difference, you know, you've obviously done both, what's the difference between what a publicist at a record company does or a record label and uh, someone who works exclusively and directly for a particular artist? Are they complementary when you're in a record label situation or are they all doing the same thing and you've just got a bigger bang? Um, yeah, I think they do do the same thing, ultimately. Um, you're saying like an independent publicist as opposed to a publicist at a record label. Yeah, they're doing the same thing. So independent publicists are competing with the label's publicists um, to get that editorial coverage or, you know, that mention in street press. And so if, I, if I've got a record label, do I need my own publicist? Or can I... Is that one of the advantages of having your own label? You just rely on um, the internal machinations? No, because there are... I mean, there are some artists signed to major labels who have their own publicists. And they just like to keep it. They may have started with the publicists from day one, so they want to keep them part of the team, even though they're signed to a label. Um, or they just might like to have that extra manpower because they, for some reason, perhaps a record company can't, you know, facilitate or you know work it for them in the manner that they feel, you know, it should be done. So they just like having that person there um, to make sure their needs are met. And how do you decide if you're going to work with a particular artist? Or I think you've got to love the music. You know, you've got to. Um, yeah, you get various emails and bits and pieces sent to you and you really, you listen to it and you've got to believe in it and know that you can go out there and sell it with conviction and you're going to fight the fight for that artist. So, um, so you're a bit like Bill and a bit cheesy. Well, you know, well, look, you do because, you know, it's, it, it's expensive. Like, this is people's hard-earned cash that they're investing and, you know, you've absolutely got to believe in it and know you can go the, the whole nine yards for them. I think it's really important. Just, you know, just don't do anything that you don't believe in. So... Probably a question for everybody, you know, speaking about the publicity role and marketing, how important do you think it is these days to get your music played on radio? And how can an independent artist um, who's trying to do the DIY route um, get their music on the radio? There's two very distinct types of radio, I think. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, and, and the community sector and the kind of commercial radio sector don't really bear much resemblance, resemblance to each other. No, um, and, and then there's the ABC. Sure, and so if you're a kind of commercially oriented pop artist, then obviously it's really vital to get on commercial radio. And if you're a indie rock band, then except in the most exceptional of circumstances, you're probably just not going to get paid on commercial radio, no matter what you do. So you need to understand what your market is. And you know, for example, if you're a death metal band and you hired Nicole because you wanted to get on Today FM, That's you got a pretty bad plan, you know, and you need to. <laughs> think about what you're trying to achieve and what's realistic. Yeah. People talk about radio being over and, and you yeah. can do it without radio, but the reality is it's still the most powerful mm. media. It, 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 it probably won't last you know, forever. It might have 10 years in it, but yeah. radio is still mm -hmm. vital. And for most people, that means community radio and ABC, because as Brett said, commercial radio is incredibly difficult to get onto and so, so another so what are the pathways yeah, hold other conversations yeah. <laughs> we might annoy Nicole in a minute about um, commercial radio but mm. first talking about um, community radio and perhaps the ABC uh, what are the pathways for DIY artists to get their music there uh, I don't know if people were familiar but there's been a bit of a hiccup I know with AMRO funding mm. in the last which is with their funding really yeah, it's quite devastating because yeah. AMRO is you know, a, an amazing way to get to yeah. community radio. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you can hire radio pluggers who do an incredibly good job. Um, or, you know, Triple J's doors are pretty open to be able to take music yeah. in yourself. Sit in reception for a few hours. Yeah, you might have to sit morning. and wait for a while. <laughs> and, and yeah. Nicole, you, you've had experience 
Yes. As a plugger. Okay. Yes. As I know. So how do you how do you approach commercial radio? Do you think there's any point in people sitting in reception all morning as a DIY? I think Do you um, need to know someone to, to get to reception? No, I mean look, you know, are you saying as an artist without yeah. having a radio plug in? If they yeah, want to exactly. just do it themselves? If they're doing it themselves, yeah. Um, you look, you have to get yourself the appointment. Um, and then, like um, I think Bill or, or Brett was saying before, these people are approachable and their contacts, you know, you can just ring up the station and get put through the music director, so you can get the appointments and you can do it. Um, I think, though, that you need the professional services of someone who's got the relationship with the music director, who sort of has a very good understanding of their playlist and the kind of music they're looking for. Um, they're... Yeah, I mean, I, I think you really just have to have a specific understanding of what radio does. So I think community radio, I think, you know, some younger bands could actually handle themselves. Um, you know, FBI, I know you send a CD and they email you back. And they have open days, you, you know, yeah. stuff like that. They tell you when the C who the CD's been sent to. And so the community's easy to work like that. Commercial radio, I just think that you need mm. someone in there to, yeah, because it's tough. One point I just want to make on the, on the whole DIY versus major label thing as well is that with all these areas, any artist who's had massive success as DIY, what they've essentially done is built their, their own, own record team. company. Mm. Yeah. Or not their own record company, but they've got a team member the who, who does yeah. exactly what yeah. each bits of a record company do. You know, John Butler's a fantastic example. Yeah. He has a big team. He has Russell looking after his radio. Jonesy's on press full time. Yeah. You know, Phil does all the marketing. He literally has somebody doing every single function of a record company. Yeah. And so DIY is not necessarily about sitting in reception. Yeah, and, and, and there's itself. a version of that from every band that's done it on their own, from, mm. you know, and here and overseas, from yeah, Fugazi to Art vs. Science. Yeah, if you do it on your own, you, you replicate that Model. group of yeah. people yeah. And, and do it that way. And the other thing is, now more than ever, but at every point in history, the idea that once you do a record deal, a major label record deal, you can kick your heels back because someone's going to do everything for you now is a complete fantasy. And, yeah. and always has and always was. Yeah. Even more so now. Yeah. You, you've, al you've always got to work incredibly hard and have a team that works incredibly hard, whether your team involves a major label, an independent label, or no label. Um, and, and, you know, and, and maybe that's the way it should be. No one should care about your career more than you. Absolutely. <clears throat> Back to radio for one second. We talked about um, the two distinct sorts of radio. So, <laughs> with the difficulty of pitching stuff, you know, much more easy with community radio, perhaps with the ABC, very difficult with commercial radio. Do I need to worry about the format? I mean, is it if I can just get plays anywhere, should I be worried about matching my you music won't, formats? Or you won't get plays. Play? You won't get plays if it doesn't suit the format. So, so, so just, they'll just that in the boat straight away. It, so yeah, you don't need to worry about that. No, I mean, they know, radio programmers know, or it's, or it's a plugger's job to push them and instill in them that they might need to play this, but ultimately, they know what sort of music suits their playlist and they're not... And, and where you're bashing your head against them. Yeah, them. exactly. Like, okay. Don't give up, forget about it. So, in, in terms of trying to um, get my name out there, get known, um, should I be giving it away? Where should I be focusing um, on marketing and fan engagement? Should, should be directed online. Um, oh, I think for, you if you're a brand new artist, um, yes, I think there is definitely a place for free music. Um, I, at the end of the day, as soon as you release anything, it's probably going to come up on a P2P site. So rather than have like a dodgy version out there, if you're a brand new artist, give it to your fans in a good quality format. You know, actually build up your fan base work it organically, start it up and, and you know what, those people who download it for free, yeah sure you're not getting any money from the track but they're probably more likely to come along to your gig and pay you money, a buy a t-shirt yeah. buy a CD at the gig, yeah. whatever Like you, you are going to get it back, it's just all about fostering your community initially and, and, and really growing that and, and nurturing it and really paying attention to them So in, in terms of that community then, you think um, you need a network and an ability to engage with Online. Definitely. And that's not increasing more and more important. Oh, very much so, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and it's not only about getting likes on Facebook. 
Yeah, because uh, just getting a number of likes on Facebook, that's what everyone refers to as, as a passive audience. Um, you actually need to, to convert those passive audience members to active audience members, like active members of your community who will actually engage with you and interact with you. And that's the real big challenge, is actually getting people to interact. But that's and what you see that certain artists do that incredibly well yeah. via their social media, whereas a, a stream of this gig, that gig, yeah. you know, it, it's, not, it's not like, for example, Twitter or Facebook, it's not a broadcast medium, it's supposed to be an interactive medium yeah. and, mm. and the people who, or the artists who, who really, not just the artists, but the people who get the benefit of that are the people that understand that. Yeah, well, it's think. social media, yeah. you have to be social. <laughs> <laughs> So who do you, we're talking about putting a team together, who can help, who, who are the best sort of people and who do you speak to and engage to manage that sort of interaction or, or to help you manage that interaction? For on, online, online, social media? Um, look, most places these days, um, be it you know, management groups or, or record labels, will have someone who is a social media manager or a community manager um, who naturally spends a lot of time on there. Um, if you are doing a, a DIY, then I, you just need to make sure that you're good at it. Take yourself off for a course. It's a, a, it, it, seriously, there is nothing that is going to turn people off more than you tweeting what you just had for breakfast. And, and you're going to lose all your fans. You know, take yourself off for a course and do it right. Um, and if you know what, if you can't do it yourself, and you've got a mate that's really, really good with you know all the geeky stuff, then ask them to do it for you. You know, they if they know you and they know what your voice is meant to sound like, then there's nothing wrong with actually getting in help and finding someone who can do it for you. So let's talk about money. Where we're going to get some income. Can we talk about licensing? If I'm, if I'm being my own record label, um, can I put my own team together to be my own record label? Do it myself? Do I still need a publisher? Um, Again, you don't need a publisher, but I think publishers are providing a more and more valuable service. Um, you know, on a, on a number of levels. Uh, I think traditionally a lot of artists felt they didn't need a publisher mm -hmm. until there was a really big buzz about them and they could go out and get the biggest check possible. Mm -hmm. I personally believe getting a publisher on board earlier on is, can be a lot more important than getting a label on, on yeah. board early on. Um, they can provide you with some funding, some advice, they can hook you up with other songwriters, there are licensing opportunities that are happening early and earlier for, for developing artists. <laughs> Um, and a lot of publishers and, and have collect, distribution and they, met, met models as well. Now. Yeah, and yeah. they collect money that you don't know where that money is. is uh, and, and I think Bill's point is a, is a good one across this whole thing is, um, you know, do I need a record company? Do I need a publisher? Is a very individual question. Mm. If you're going to do everything yourself, that, that's a very hard job. And yeah, some, people, some people are really yeah. good at it. Yeah. And, and some artists, whatever the... Whatever the kind of positives or negatives of major label deals are, there are some artists who, if they get an opportunity to do that, should absolutely do that because they will never be able to replicate those services themselves. And there are some artists who, because of their ability to build things up organically and build them up on their own, given what you need to give away to do a major label deal these days, would be completely mad mm. to do it because they'll be sacrificing a good business for a bad one. And, and, but it's a very individual choice. And it's not, you can't just go, you know, two legs good, four legs bad, or, mm. or whatever. Absolutely. I think I had that around the wrong way. Yeah. I <laughs> think you get my <laughs> point. Bad with legs, but, yeah. <laughs> George Orwell. Three legs. <laughs> well, there's a lot of dogs in Newtown with three legs. They're going all right, though. <laughs> Publishers are very active in, obviously, if you're signed to a publisher, in pitching your songs for TV and ads and, and, and things like that. And a, a number of publishers, if you are an unsigned artist that owns your own recordings, will pitch your recordings. Well, obviously, your recordings are part of that package and will often handle that for you for a fee. And that's quite a, 
and common and arrangement. That, I mean, we've done it with, with Paul Kelly, who signed the Sony ATV Publishing, but because he owns all his own masters, he, we have a non-exclusive arrangement where Universal, who distribute his physical product, they can bring licences in and we pay them a cut. But Sony ATV, if they get that licence that comes through the publishing side, we've given them the right to issue the master licence as well. Okay. So they can actually be a one-stop shop for all of it. So it's not just for young people. Yeah. yeah, try to get it everywhere. And um, who manages then things like public performance, broadcast review? How do we make sure we're getting our share of that money? Um, Join the PCA. Join PCA. <laughs> the PCA. Yeah. And you do it all in. He's such a good group. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, and Oprah, obviously. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't change whether you are, whether you're signed or unsigned. You should as an artist be a member of APRA and the PPCA, yeah. uh, and I'm not just saying that. Yeah. Um, try and access all the income streams you can. Indeed. Yeah, and the only difference if you are unsigned with PPCA is you need to register as an artist and a label. That's right. Yeah, get that's both, right. Get both but, sides but we of the money. we do all that, people downstairs, I mentioned. <laughs> Absolutely, go to the booth. So, I mean, one thing I've noticed while I've been at, at PPCA, obviously I think everyone on the panel will have noticed, is the great increase in people who are doing it themselves or creating your own recordings. As we said, it's become a lot less expensive. I think when I first started with PPCA, we had about 80 record labels signed up and were part of the blanket licence. And I think last week it was sitting at about 1,100. And that explosion in, in sort of copyright owners or people who own recordings has uh, obviously not been at the major label end of the spectrum. We still have the four that we had all those years ago. Um, all the growth has been That's about to go down a bit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, that, all that growth has been in, um, in areas where people are doing it themselves or even individual artists who just own you know, one recording perhaps. So we, we've seen that change in numbers. So obviously more people are doing it themselves. I think what we covered in the panel this afternoon is, is the fact that you can do it yourself but you still have to put your team together because there are a lot of bases that need to be covered. And it's probably a question of working out, particularly the beginning, which bits are within your areas of capability and knowledge and where you need to call in expertise and get the best help to put the best team together. So can we just talk about then the elements that you see as the essential um, elements of the team, whether the artist is doing it themselves or not? What are those key categories where you need to have activity happening and probably happening at, at the same time? Um, so anyone can jump in with you probably all got different um, yeah. perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't how it sort of and goes down the line. And it's different for every artist as yeah. well. That's you know why I still enjoy being a manager. Is every artist and every project they do is different. There's no blueprint to do it. But I think first of all you need someone to run that team, and that might be yourself, or you know that's where a manager steps in a lot of the time. Um, you will need a lawyer. You know probably from the very beginning to do you know band agreements and you need to get all that stuff That's sorted out. Very well. Right. <laughs> yeah. Management yeah. agreement would be a good start. Yeah. I um, just think that, I mean, most people in this room are, are very creative. Um, if, if you are right brain, then admit it. And, you know, it, 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 really <laughs> admit it. Get yourself, you know, a lawyer, get yourself an accountant, get someone who is left brain to look after all that for you, you know? Like, just just be realistic in, in terms of what you are capable of doing. Um, it, no one ever said, I want to get into a rock band to do my bass. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we yeah. yeah, I think at the right time, obviously, promotion and publicity yeah. is important um, in terms of you know, radio and, and press coverage, etc. But it's, yeah, it's got to be at the right time when you've got everything firing and you've got a retail set up and that kind of thing. You've got the product there ready to go. Very important. And then get the people in. Yeah. That's right. I mean, that's the thing I used to talk about when I worked at record labels, that sometimes in promotions we forgot what it was we were doing. I was so busy trying to get reviews and things like, well, what are we actually trying to achieve? Oh, we're trying yeah. to sell music, aren't we? <laughs> and you actually forgot because you were just busy, you know, little, little mice on the wheel mm. doing the work and actually forgetting what the end point was. Self yeah, so, stuff. So someone needs to be in charge of the master plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Don't yeah. lose sight of that. Yeah. And yeah. ultimately you want to sell concert tickets or albums or singles or t-shirts or whatever. Yeah. That's and the that's the whole point of building up your team, you know, just to give you the time to do what you're good at, which is write music, perform music, 
and get out there and, and talk to your community and talk to your fans. Um, if, if you do have to stay at home two nights you know, every month doing your baths, yeah. then you know, it's, it's almost a waste of your time because someone might be able to do that for you in two hours. Um, so, yeah, it, that, that's the whole point of building up your team is actually letting you do what you're best at. And I suppose also the trade-off as you can afford to pay people yeah. for the expertise. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you probably have to stay home and do your best <laughs> until you're in a position. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, or you've got a, a new fridge who's good. Do it for you. you. Give you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, can we just go down the panel then and, and hear from each of you what, what you think are the, the advantages of having um, a record label behind you, um, the downsides, and what are the good things and bad things about doing it yourself? Nick, we started, um, you're yeah, from my end, I think um, I think Bill touched on this. I think for certain acts, a major label works really well, and um, you know, there's no doubt that with a major label comes a lot of clout, and um, you know, they've got the ability to do some trade-offs and bits and pieces like that, and that happens all the time, and you know, they they put very good deals together at retail, that kind of stuff. So, you know, they are they are still powerful in that sense, but then. The downside of that is that they've got a lot less staff, a lot more releases, it's very, very competitive and you have to make sure that, you know, you're getting looked your after, or, yeah, your piece of, you know, your time, whatever. So I think in doing it independently, you've got control over that, you know, and if you've chosen your team and you've put that together, then, you know, you're really in control, so, but I think horses for courses, I think there's some acts that just, you know, do suit the major label model still and other acts who suit the... You're doing it themselves. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> um, <no. laughs> um, I think, yeah, like I said before, there comes a tipping point with a lot of artists that it just makes sense for them to naturally go to a major label um, or just any label. Um, that the the what what the labels offer is relationships. Is that they've you know preformed relationships where they can you know go out to to radio, to TV, to what have you, and, and they can pitch on your behalf. Um, but like Nicole said, you know, you, ha you still have to be able to stay on top of it. You yeah. need to be able to do what's best for you, and that, that could involve keeping your own publicist on board because, mm. it, you know, if you happen to get a contract with Universal, you, you think about how many labels and how many That's artists cool. they represent, and you could be one in a pile of 50 that they're taking into radio. And next year. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but um, so it, it's still kind of being honest about where you are and doing what's right for you. And I suppose we've talked about, um, I keep putting questions about, you know, A-label versus doing it yourself. I suppose the other question is, Yes. Yeah. And you know what? Ask. Ask people. You know, pick up the phone and, and call people in the industry. There's not that very many people who will just slam the phone down on you. And if they do, then, you know, that you should be talking to them anyway. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want advice, the best way to get it is to ask. You know, the, I mean, forums such as this are perfect ways to, you know, make the contacts and just have people that you can go to for advice. Look, funding is one thing that major labels still offer that, you know, you do need. I think at the end of the day, if the kind of music you make needs to get to a mass audience quickly, then a major label is still probably the only way to do that. So if you're doing, you know, real top 40 pop that needs to be on commercial play, uh, radio and you need to be all over the media to cut through. Yeah, so it's a hard DIY must It's pretty hard to do DIY. If the kind of music you make probably appeals more to a niche audience and you're patient and you've got time to keep working and slowly build your audience, then I think that DIY is perfectly possible. Um, so yeah, it really all depends on your situation. Then there's a lot of acts who've been with major labels for years and could have the advantage of majors having built the audience for them that have been able to do it themselves. And, and that was, I was going to ask Brett, who would have seen people, was, I imagine, on the way in with labels big and small and then yeah, I mean, you know, when 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 uh, when Radiohead 
released in rainbows and, and did it through their mm. own website. You, could pay, you know, that's the biggest news story. You know, artists are doing it themselves, yeah. da, da 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 But really, would anyone have known who they were if EMI hadn't invested well, yeah, in the five that's records before that? Yeah, Pro yeah, probably yeah. not. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree with everyone that, that the, the, the great advantage of, of signing with a label, big or small, is, is the infrastructure that they bring and the investment that they bring and, and, the, and the knowledge of what it takes to put out a record and hopefully make it successful. Um, as time goes on, most, certainly every major label record deal and a lot of independent record deals will require you now, which they did not do in the past, to give you a share of their other businesses mm. in return for investing in your recordings. And I think you've got to think really long and hard about that because I think there is an element of getting a share of what is a, a, a vibrant and more important business than the recording business. I think as time goes on, the money that you can expect to make out of your recordings as opposed to the other parts of your business will necessarily decline as less people pay for recordings and they pay less for the recordings that they pay for. Mm. Um, and, and the rise of streaming services just that brings that into an even uh, more stark light as everyone who's been using Spotify for free this week <laughs> would, would attest. Uh, on the other side of that, uh, why would you do it DIY? Well, if John Butler had have sold exactly the same number of records on Sony or Universal as he sold on his own, he would have made a lot less money. And that's why you want to... There would be no JBC. That's exactly. right. But not everyone can do that. And, and the number of artists who have done that very well in Australia, from the Whitlams to, to John Butler to The Waste to Sneaky Sound System to Art vs Science, the number of artists who have done that well and successfully is much, much smaller than the number of artists that have tried to do that and done mm. it really badly. So um, just saying it's better to put out your own record and reap the rewards of that is a very simplistic approach to what is a very difficult business. And um, the other thing that I will also say, which kind of goes across all of this, is you've got to work out what value you give to your own without wanting to sound like a wanker, but what value are you going to give to your own art and what you do and how valuable it is? Because I think as business gets tougher, I, I see a lot of people who think that any deal is better than no deal. And, and I couldn't disagree with that more. I, I think in, in taking your career forward, um, a bad deal is far more damaging to you than no deal. And if you get no deal and you believe in what you do, you can continue to build um, an audience and hopefully bide your time for a better deal. A bad deal probably won't prevent your career moving forward, but it probably will prevent you ever getting paid anything for doing it. So um, I think some people's desperation to have someone believe in them will see them do any deal that comes across their table, and I think that is you know, uh, uh, I think that approach is really wrong. Okay, now if, if I timed this right, we should have a few minutes for questions. Uh, oh, please. <laughs> yeah, hello. Could, could we start over here? Thank you. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Um, g'day. Um, I produce my own arts, so I have my own masters, and I have licensed to majors before. Now, one of my artists has just finished an album, and I've got three or four singles. But what I would need to know is in a licensing arrangement, am I better off doing a DIY or going with a major, given that I don't need my recordings funded, I don't need my videos funded, and I'm being told that I can expect around a 20 to 25% return back on a licensing deal, which is quite it, what my act would get anyway if you were what, signed to a major. So what, what's that, the that, point? See, what, what you, if you're a production company sitting between a major label and an artist, you know, typically the, the major label just deals with the artist. So you're trying to fit three people into a two-person relationship. Uh, and if, unless you're French, that probably won't work. Um, <laughs> and so the question is, the record label, to get that record, is not necessarily going to pay any more for it just because you're there. So unless... Um, if you and the artist are going to you know, share in what the artist would have got on their own, then the record label is going to have to sell incrementally a lot more copies to make that financially worthwhile for you. So 
that's not a kind of black and white answer, but that's the formula that you've got to look at by putting two of us into a system that is typically used to paying one, how do we both get what we want to get? And the answer is you've got to sell a, a very large amount of records, uh, I almost said shitload, uh, <laughs> to do that. Important as an eight track cartridge single. <laughs> yeah. You do a burn. Yeah, you take burns to you burn, burns. And get burns done. Yeah. So, so we don't worry about artwork anymore. Oh, well, you, you want to present those burns nicely, so we might just do it in a yeah. nicely cut. I think it's a lovely package she's doing. Oh, I do. I've got people. Sorry, Hills, who do them for me? Colour printer, guillotine. The best way to build a relationship with a professional is to pay them. Yeah. High yeah. Five, or they're not a professional. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's their hobby, you know, yeah. I guess. I think you need to target friendships you develop, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah relationships, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, I know that was a kind of a smart ass answer, but the reality is that I, I think people are pretty generous with their time in this business, but it's a business. and. For example, you know, I have staff and rent and insurance and everything like everyone else's business does, mm -hmm. and so I will try to be as generous with my time as possible, but um, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with someone who wants to get what I sell for free. And also I think you, not you, but artists have to work out, is this a hobby or is this what I do want to do with my life as a business? And if you set up any other kind of business, uh, you wouldn't get services for free. And if your business is being a rock band, I don't think you can expect to get them for free just because being a rock band is cooler than many other businesses. And I know that that may not be what you want to hear, but uh, there you have it. Mm. I think um, what I would recommend is that you know, if you do only have limited funds, work out what your most immediate need is. Is it, is it management? Then that's where you put your, that's where you put your money. You know, because you might not need to, to contract with a lawyer or an accountant or, or a publicist until you've got your shit sorted out. You know, and until you've got someone who's actively looking, helping you with the touring. Or with see, I'd, offer, I'd say that you don't need a manager until you've kind of proven that you've done it yourself. Yourself, yeah. Because the manager's, again, it's not going to, 20% of nothing's nothing. Yeah. So I'm not going to take on a artist unless I believe that, that I'm going to be able to earn something out of you know, back to yeah. I run a business, my overheads are six figures. I can't just, yeah. you know, I've had arguments with artists who sent me demos before and said, why can't you give me a full critique of the demo? It's like, because I'm paid to manage the artists that I'm yeah. doing and every minute that I'm spending listening to a demo of an artist that I'm not going to manage yeah. anyway is taken away from my clients who yeah. pay me to do yeah. what they but, but, but being upfront is incredibly powerful. Like, people ring me up and say, look, I need this thing done and it's going to take this amount of time and I either have no money or I'll have money in a couple of weeks or I've got this amount of money and, and I will almost always try to work out a way to do that. It's the people who ring you up and get you to do something and then yeah. you can't get them on the phone where you need to get paid that you'll just, not only will you not work with them again, but you'll tell everybody you know not to work with them too. So um, you can, if you're honest and, and upfront with people, they might say, I'm sorry, I can't help you. 
or they might say, look, you, you're being honest, I like what you do, I think your band is really good, let's work something out. And a publicist might say, look, I think you're fucking fantastic, so I'll do it for yeah, half crazy. or a third of the rate that yeah. I might normally do it. Look, the good thing is now there are a lot of publicists out there. I mean, yeah. A lot of publicists have left record labels, started their own businesses, and you know it's a pretty competitive business. So mm. you know if you ha make some you know calls and do some investigation, maybe ta find some bands that you really like, how they've been put into the media, work out who did that job, and and um, you just have some conversations. And we're all sure pretty you... passionate about music, Absolutely. or we'd be doing other things because yeah. there's much yeah. easier ways of making music. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know, yeah, if you're upfront with what you've got, you might find people are. Yeah, willing yeah. to do a deal. I think yeah, you've been very patient. Can we have your question? Well, as far as the, the back to the 360 deal thing you mentioned, it used to be seen as almost legally very touching for the uh, same label and the uh, publishing division to own both rights essentially of the same artist. And now you've got a um, bit of double dipping or recouping from cross recuperation, etc. What was it that changed? in legal thinking that made that any different because is it just because the labels are making less money? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really agree that it was ever legally touchy to do a record deal and a publishing deal with the same person. That's never been my experience. I think there was always... questioned it morally. There was always... Well, I think, I think it was a different question. If, 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 the, if the proposal was, you know... I want to do a record deal with you, but I won't do it with you unless I get your publishing. There's no legal impediment to that, but I think some people found that uh, difficult to accept. I think if you got separate recording and publishing offers from the same people that, and you were free to accept them or reject them, I don't think anyone had a problem. I think what's changed is that um, people accept that just investing in recordings, or certainly investing in, the, in recordings at the level that people have traditionally invested in recordings, without getting a share of some other revenue may be a pretty bad business to be in. And if you're a record company, I can understand that idea. I don't think it necessarily follows uh, that as an artist, therefore you should do it, but that's the decision that you've got to make when you, or if you get those offers. Mm. Well, whenever you do a record deal 20 years ago or now, how much money you get is always a function of what your royalty was and how much you spent on recording and how much you spent on making your videos. So if you are, you know, Noiseworks and you make a record, or better yet, if you're Killing Time and you make a record for half a million bucks and videos and you make it all in New York and then you don't, and you sell a lot of records, but not enough records, you're not going to make a lot of money. If you're the White Stripes and you make Elephant for £8,000 and sell a million records, you're going to make a lot of money. So even when record companies were prepared to spend a lot more money than they're prepared to spend now, it's always been a function of what you spend versus your royalty and balancing you know, the fun of having... Uh, you know, a lot of money spent on you and making a record with Bob Rock versus whether you're ever going to get a royalty again in your life. Strange, for the first time ever, I now manage three artists who are all recouped. I've never had that in 20-something years of managing. And it's not that they're selling less records. It's because the labels are spending a fifth of what they were on making records. We're not getting six-figure tour support to go overseas. And we're making videos for ten to fifteen thousand dollars instead of eighty to hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So the artists are actually recouping. Okay, look, we we'll just have one more question, then we really should be gone, I think, because I'm sure the next session's is standard. Can we just take yours and then we'll go? There are record labels now like Grand Control that are trying to like kind of couple the advantages of DIY. 
I think it's a really interesting model, and I hope it works. Um, it'll be interesting because I think with something like Create Control, they have a really good team of people. I just wonder if this, where they need to scale to to make it work, whether that then means that there are too many artists for that team to provide enough attention to. Yeah. But I, I hope there are. Yeah, I just I think that they're going to have to have where due process might need four releases at any given time to fund the workings of that team. Create control might need twenty or thirty because they're going to be selling at lower volumes. But um, I think it's a great model, and, and I think inertia it's a, have a it's, similar one yeah, as well. Yeah, inertia direct or whatever inertia it's called. Access. Yeah. Inertia access, and I think you'll see in recording and publishing that there there is a move from an ownership model, which is what traditional mm. record companies has been to a service provision model where you can opt in and opt out of the services and, that you and want. And major labels are doing And, you know, and you know it'll them. be interesting to see how that plays out. And there, there is, you know, you see that in publishing as well and you'll probably see it in management and things mm. like that. Yeah. Modular services are all the rage now. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to leave it there now, I think, because I'm not sure if they need a room. But will you just join me in <laughs> thanking the